Republic instead. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? The women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions. On January 6th of 2021, you had tens of thousands of people peacefully protesting. So, it's not a right-wing conspiracy theory. It's not QAnon. It's real. <laughs> hey, folks. Welcome back to the Enemies List. I'm your host, Rick Wilson. I, we're doing another Q&A session today. We have been collecting a lot of these questions that folks are sending in uh, for the show um, you can send them to info at the rickwilson.com and we will try to get all as many of them on the air uh, as we can. Uh, I've had to go through and pick and choose. We haven't done a Q&A episode in about a month, so we're going to take the most recent questions first. One of the one or two of these are evergreens that we'd had previously, but I'm going to do my best to um, to, um, you know, cover as much as we can in this in this mini episode. So the first question is from Ian. Ian asks, what states should Harris be focused on and what states does Trump have to have to win the election? Um, here's what's happened with the with the Electoral College map. And by the way, folks, that's the only game in town. The only game in town, that the, the only thing that matters. There's nothing else that matters. The Electoral College map is the only game in town. I don't care what the popular vote is because it doesn't make a difference. In a perfect world, maybe it would but it doesn't. So the states right now that that Harris needs to win, she has to run up a big win. And and I say this because you know, Joe Biden had a meaningful win over Donald Trump in the year of our Lord 2020. Let's not forget Donald Trump um got his ass handed to him in the electoral college in 2020. Got whooped, got beat got spanked. Joe Biden had a 306 to 232 win in 2020. And we know Trump lost fair and square. We know all of his his constant river of lies about this has convinced a lot of Americans that wasn't true. But that was a whipping. We have to do better. And and I, that's a that's a tough one, okay? I know how tough that is. I know how how really really bad that is. You know, this is not uh, an easy lift. So look, <clears throat> there are a lot of pathways to the electoral college victory, but she needs a big one. She needs to spank him. She needs to crush him. This can't be, this, this has got to look a lot more like 2008 than 2020. And even in 2008, the Republicans didn't really learn their lesson. Okay. They didn't really internalize their lesson. So there's a world where I could see her getting to 324 pretty well. I could see her getting to 324 uh, if she wins, um, you know, all the blue states. We know she's going to win. Also, Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina, Michigan, Arizona, Wisconsin. Nevada, I think is still, it's a, you know, she's closing up in Nevada. It's still a reach, okay? Trump has to really, really run the board, okay, to make this work. He has to run the board. So if he took every single swing state right now, he'd be at 301. Now, he's not going to take every single swing state. That's not going to happen, okay? Um, but we're in a world right now, I think, where, where the, fear of, the fear of this, uh, of this map having too many options for Trump and too few for, for Harris has inverted. She has a lot of paths to victory right now, and she's ahead in a lot of the places where she needs to win right now. So, look, Trump has to Trump has to really, really, really score um, all of the big states in play. Um, you know, especially Pennsylvania. That's where they're putting most of their juice right now. That's where they're putting most of their energy right now. They have now abandoned New Hampshire. I know that's a small state, but it is a state that matters, um, and it is a state that that Trump had a great fear of losing and they've lost it. It's out. They have, they've pulled out. They are not playing the game anymore. Um, you know, basically Democrats always come in with about 237 solid States and Republicans come in with about 
208 solid states generally. I mean, that's, that's, that's ballparking a lot. So, you know, you've got to make, you've got to make up, um, you've got to make up a lot of ground if you're Donald Trump this year and the election looks like it looks, um, there are probably 20 or more scenarios where she can win and probably 10 or fewer scenarios where he can win. If you, if you build this mosaic of the States out, it's as hard to do not on a, not on a slide deck or not on a, in a visual presentation, but I hope it makes some sense. So Trump, again, he has to basically run the board. She gets to pick and choose. So, um, and there are some, there are a couple of Republican states that have gotten very squirrely, that have moved from solid red to lean. And if you had said to me a year ago that the Republican map would have Texas, Ohio, and Florida as likely Republican or lean, I mean, excuse me, lean Republican instead of safe Republican or likely Republican instead of safe Republican, I would have told you to go fuck yourself. I would have said you're on crack. But right now, there's a reason that the 538 and other models um, are shifting. And it, it, it is in part because states that looked solid, states that looked like they were in the bag for Trump, have, have, have no longer that impervious Republican nature. Now, there are plenty of states that still are impervious Republican states because they're small states. And they are, and they are you know, I know where Oklahoma is going to be. I know where Alabama is going to be. So we're not, we're not seeing a giant red wall right now. The national voting surveys, you know, show this very tight um, race, you know, point, two points here or there, um, you know, Harris two, Trump one, blah, blah, blah. This is um, all the trend lines are pointing away from Donald Trump. And one of the things we're seeing right now is that her favorability rating is going up fast. It is now just just about net positive, which is absolutely shocking compared to where she was. Trump's favorability, unfavorability rating, he is upside down. He is always upside down. I mean this without any facetiousness. He is always upside down. He has a peak favorability rating of about 43%. He cannot cross that barrier. It it just doesn't it does it doesn't sustain. He may go up like a like a half a point here or half point there, down half point here, half point there, but his unfavorability favorability rating is stuck. It has been stuck for years. It's about a ten point upside down rating. That is that is something that is fundamentally broken right now in in, in Trump's world. The other data point that I would would look at when you look at these states predictively is. Um, <clears throat> For a long time, we had a high ball game, basically, statistically tied, of who do you want to see control power in Washington and in Congress. For a long time this year, it was it was we want the Republicans in charge, um, and the Democrats were just behind them. I think we can ascribe that to a Joe Biden effect on the ticket, as he was having so much trouble, because right now. About 47% of people want Republican or Democrats in charge, about 44% are Republicans in charge. It's not a big split yet, but it's a growing split. The trend lines, again, are running away from the Republicans very quickly. Um, and I think that we're going to see a we're going to see that starts to leak into some of the states. One other thing about um, about the states is you will see now how the how statewide candidates on the ballot in North Carolina, <clears throat> Ohio, and maybe even Florida hurt the Republicans. Look, Rick Scott is going to win Florida most likely because he's got a jillion dollars of stolen Medicare money um, to spend. He's going to spend it all. Um, but Bernie Moreno in Ohio is a train wreck. Um, he is hurting them desperately. Okay. Um, we've got We've got a a candidate in North Carolina, Mark Robinson, who is so absolutely insane, so completely bonkers that he is dragging down the the GOP ticket, including Donald Trump. Even Donald Trump's own people are like, this guy's poison. Oh, fuck. They can't go back and campaign with him. But too late, Donald. You recorded a lot of video with the guy. 
All right, so that's my what state sort of polling overview. Look, it is a it is a tie game. If the election were held today, we would have President Harris, but we would also have 10 months of fucking lawsuits from Donald Trump. Um, where do I stand on the mic or no mic controversy? Um, I don't have a name on that one, but uh, the mic or no mic controversy in the debate. As you may have heard, um, there, the debate rules for the first debate with Joe Biden um, stated that the mics would be muted while the other candidate was speaking. That was viewed to be a negative for Trump and a positive for Biden in the first debate. But we know what that debate was. So it really didn't come to the fore. Donald Trump's advisors and staff members and enablers desperately do not want him talking out of turn. They do not want him yelling over her, talking over her, trying to interrupt her. Because if he does, um, the visual of it is really not good for him. Look, when Donald Trump hovered behind Hillary Clinton, you all remember that moment, okay? You all remember that moment, lurking behind her, like a like a big sort of like orange lurch. Um, and that was a bad physicality moment in the debate, and physicality matters in these debates. Physicality actually makes a difference in these debates, like how you look and pose and posture. I think she's going to have a very um, interesting moment on the stage. Presence wise, he's going to try to lurk over her and lean over her and look down on her. And he may try to come out from behind his podium and go over towards her. Now, I will say this to Vice President Harris. I would say this to anybody behind that, that podium. The minute he takes a single step for you, step out from behind the podium, stride toward him faster and say, get back, go back to your, go back to your box, get back in your box, go back in your podium. That's enough. Sit down. Gimp him. Treat him like he is a child. Treat him like you are the dominant force on that stage because that's what you are. Treat him like he means nothing and is nothing. Don't act offended. Act amused. Don't act frightened. Act like it's he's a crazy person walking around with his dick hanging out which is not impossible with Trump. It could happen on this stage. So I am in the, I'm in the, you know, I would prefer open mics. I don't care at this point. Trump will yell and bellow over if he wants to. Um, whether or not the house will cut the mic level on all the audio channels down to zero is another question. I would prefer that they would, but you know, Trump is, he is a showman. Don't forget that he is a behavioral, um, he's a behavioral showman. Um, I think Harris has shown us that she can play the same game. Uh, I think Harris has shown us she can play the same, have the same lift. Um, and, and whether or not, whether or not you end up with, with live mics or cold mics, it doesn't matter. I think she's going to whip his ass in this debate. If I was to advise her on the, on the course of the debate, I would absolutely recommend at the very highest order, do not go in prepped for policy. Do not go in and try to say, well, on line 17 of my homeownership plan, no, 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 no. Remember what you're doing. You're on the stage possibly for the only time against Donald Trump. <clears throat> you have to show America you're stronger, smarter, faster, more charismatic, better, better, and a better fit for them. You have to litigate the case against Donald Trump. Now, the reason I love her odds in this is I, and I hope she does this explicitly. I hope she does this, frames this explicitly like this. Donald, I have dealt with people, criminals like you before. You are on the dock. I am here. I am Kamala Harris for the people. And I am going to prosecute this case against you. She can do it. I think she can pull it off. Um, um, at a level that he can't even imagine yet. And it's going to be very tough for him psychologically if she does this the right way. All right. This is from David P. There's news this weekend of Jack Smith and the additional criminal charges that could be brought against Donald Trump in the reboot of the insurrection case. What do you think about that? Will it affect the election? No. Look, guys, we will not get him in court in time. Will the new information be interesting? Absolutely. Will the press cover it? Barely. 
it will all be relevant. It will all be important. It will all be cases that should be tried and that will be tried if we win. Uh, <clears throat> look, I, I've said this from for almost two years now. Look, I love the cases against Trump because it's finally some tiny fragment of accountability against this guy after decades of criminality. But they're not changing the game. They they have not changed the ideas in the heads of the American voter that that you know Donald Trump is a criminal and is therefore disqualified. Nobody who who is voting against Trump right now doesn't already believe that. Nobody voting for Trump ever believes that. And it doesn't matter what you tell Trump voters. Now it could matter some at the margins where you have um where you have some Republicans in the sort of pool that we communicate with at the Lincoln Project, um who who are already uncomfortable with Trump's criminality, who are already unhappy with Trump's criminality, that could make a difference with those folks. Still hard to tell um how that's gonna break down. Honest answer. You've got a you've got a meaningful fraction uh of of you know people in the legal community who think these these things are all going to be swept under the rug if Trump uh, wins, of course, which is, you know, I think that is the logical conclusion. Um, and you have a large fraction of people who, uh, again, who just don't care. They should care. They, they should definitely think about it. They should definitely be cognizant of it. But he's a criminal. We all know he's a criminal. And in some ways, Trump's already been convicted. In some ways, Trump's already been de de determined to be guilty. In some ways, Trump's we already know that this guy is is a, a person who committed crimes in and out of office. So that's my sort of uh, big take on that. Um, was the grandchild born? Yes, the grandchild was born on Thursday of last week. Uh, it was in the middle of a fundraiser. I... Uh, cried like a damn baby. I'm 60 years old, and suddenly the line continues, um, and 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 the 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 deliverance of a beautiful, healthy eight pound baby girl to my son and daughter in law um, is a source of unbelievable joy. Right now, we are so thrilled. We are so so over the moon about this child. Everyone in the family. Uh, extended and otherwise is absolutely in love with her already. She is gorgeous. Um, we're called her name. Her nickname is Winnie, um, and she is so cute. It's not even funny. She came out with a head of brown hair. God bless her, and is just blue eyes. Just absolutely gorgeous child. Um, and everyone is just absolutely, uh, absolutely crazy bonkers about the baby. Um, so yeah, it was um it was a long labor. Becky did great. Uh, Winnie is again perfectly healthy. She is a star. Um, you you can probably expect to see a whole lot of Instagram uh, of of Winnie Wilson um, growing up in the next few years, and hopefully um, she'll be growing up in a country that still doesn't treat her as a second class citizen and values her rights and her individual liberties. Um, can that certainly? I got to tell you. It ju it jumped up a level um, when I when 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 the kids said that, the, that Becky was pregnant. Like I recognized nine months ago, like this fight just took on a bigger impact, and I and I tried to sort of psychologically process that for a long time. But man, the second she was born, literally the second I got the 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 message that she had she had been delivered, we're at a fundraiser in New York. Stewart's talking. I look down at my phone. And he is literally talking at that moment about the millions of American women who have been terrified because of the Dobbs decision and because of an IVF ban and all these things. And at that moment, I get the news that I have a granddaughter. And puts the fight in context, really does. It, 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 it reminds me and reminds, reminds me daily now what's at stake. I don't want her growing up in an authoritarian world. I don't want her growing up in a world where where Mike Johnson and Matt Schlapp decide what women should do in this country, where Andrew Tate is venerated as a role model, um, where Donald Trump is venerated as a role model for boys. 
I mean, because no American should want their son to act like Donald Trump toward women. And no American should want their daughter to be in a workplace with a man like Donald Trump. And I want Winnie to live in a free and prosperous country. And I want Winnie to have all the rights and liberties to do whatever she damn well chooses. And that's something that I'm going to keep fighting for. And so her, 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 she's here. She is thriving. She is gorgeous. And I'm like, I said, I'm so proud of my son and daughter-in-law. They did great. And, <laughs> and yes, I am a late in life, emotional crying bitch because you know, having a grandchild, all my, all my friends in my demo and slightly older, were like, it's going to change you. It's going to shock you. It's going to be different than just the kids. Um, but yep, here we are. So it's, um, it's great news. It's really, really great news. We're delighted. Um, moving on to the next question. I don't know if this was a Trump person or, or a well-meaning person, um, you know, just asking this question. I've had this question in variations of permutations before. <sighs> Why are you so mean to Trump voters? Do you think that persuades them? First off, starting in 2015, I started doing a lot of research. I was involved in a project that did 32 focus groups in 16 cities of Republican voters who were going to support Donald Trump trying to understand how to get them back into the Republican conservative fold and out of this authoritarian cult statism, whatever you want to call Trumpism. And I realized at that point, they don't want to be rescued. They don't want to be changed, helped. They don't want to have their hypocrisy or their bullshit addressed. They don't want to be confronted with what's driving a lot of their behavior under the surface. And so I don't engage in this sort of New York Timesian, you know, people who believe in fascism have a point argument because they don't. And when I see people who are engaged in that kind of, of modern you know, uh, social media driven cult fascism for Trump. I, I am not kind to them. I'm not nice to them. They're the same people who are online saying every day, you're a pedophile and you should be hung. Fuck your kids. Um, you know, the, all rhinos must die. All this death threat bullshit all the time. And uh, folks, yes, 99.9% .9 of it is just bullshit. Just shit talking assholes on the internet. The point Oh, one percent who come to my fucking house, that's a little different. But it, look, the the idea that you have to treat people who are who are ready and willing to storm the Capitol for Donald Trump and burn down this country as if they are peers, as if they are your friends, as if you as if that idea deserves respect is mistaken. If they were making arguments based on a philosophical framework of conservatism, it would be one thing. It, it would be an, it would be one thing, okay? But they're not. And let's be real that they're not making those arguments. They're not making those arguments at all. They're not debating whether we should, you know, have a 33.8% marginal tax rate for corporations or a 35.2% marginal tax rate for corporations. They're not debating if it's 450 parts per billion of carbon or 320 parts per billion of carbon in the atmosphere. We're not debating anything with them. They're campaigning and debating against an imaginary war being waged by imaginary demons. So when someone says, you're a communist Marxist pedophile, vote Trump, that is not a line of argument worthy of respect or even decency. That is not a line of argument worthy of engagement that 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 greets their predicates as equals with actual rational predicates based in logic, fact, the world, argumentation, philosophy, identity, or anything. They are sort of the human embodiment now of oppositional defiant disorder. And so I'm not going to be nice to them. I'm not going to be pleasant to them. I will engage with people who, 
and it's a rarity. I will say this, it's a, it's a great rarity. I will engage with folks on that side of the argument who occasionally bring up a, a, a policy question. They're usually wrong in what they think the facts are, but they're the smallest minority of a minority of minority of the people that engage on this front. Um, I'm not going to debate people who have made their entire personality um, trying to burn it all down, uh, trying to, 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 to you know, be the political gasoline for Trump's national arson. So they don't, they don't deserve respect unless they, unless they have respect. They don't deserve respect unless they, they build it. And they don't care to build it. They don't want to build it. They don't really care about, about a real argument. They care about a lot of ad hominem shit. They care a lot about name calling. They care a lot about picking stuff off their MAGA Mad Lib cards. Um, communist pedophile, you know, uh, it's Marxist, F- Frankfurt School, yeah, trans, whatever it is. It's always a slurry of like weakly formed ideas and attacks um, that only feed their people. Because look, if I took. 1776 fan 12792474428 and sat him down in a room with no access to the internet and asked him to describe the principles of Marxism. You know what I'd get? He would stare slackly into space as dribble came down his chin because they don't know what it means. They don't know history. They don't know philosophy. They don't know politics. And so you haven't earned a ticket to the dance unless you're going to do the work, unless you're going to actually engage on, on the actual set of ideas that are at stake, not just Trump 2024, MAGA. That's not an argument, folks. And, and especially because all of it is wrapped up in this sort of insult you know, culture. You can't out fucking insult comedy me, people. You can't do it. Don Rickles is my spirit animal. And most of you are too young to remember who Don Rickles was. But, but Don Rickles was a guy who was the master of shutting down hecklers and they don't get a heckler's veto on me. And that's why I treat them the way I treat them. So I got one more question here. Um, what the fuck was that Laura Trump song that came to me while we were doing this? <laughs> Look guys, I'm not a singer. I can't sing a lick. I can't sing a note. I can't play or sing music or read music. It's one of the things in my life I've tried to do is read music. I can't sort of, I, there's some cognitive thing with me. It's one of the few areas where I can't train myself to do something. Uh, And I can train myself to, to do a lot of like difficult things. Um, But what was the song? (sighs) I described it on social media today as the sound of a feral pig and a sack of rusty cans being thrown into an, a wood chipper. I think I might've been being too generous, but Laura Trump should not be singing. She is not a singer. Auto tune is not your friend, Laura. It didn't help you. Um, but the Laura Trump thing, as funny as it is, it speaks to something else. And I, I think you should like kind of recognize this. Trump is crafty enough to know He's already lost the culture, entertainment, movies, music, arts. He's lost the culture. They're not, they, 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 they loathe him. They get who he is. They're not going to play the game. And MAGA has always been desperate to build their own separate hermetically sealed media culture. Ben Shapiro spends a lot of time making movies. Nobody sees them. They're on to be or whatever that is, or, or whatever, you know, platforms that the, that the writer watching things on, but they've spent a lot of time making these movies and making TV and trying to make music that narrowly conforms in this era to sort of the, the Trumpian fantasy, what the world is, um, that, that, that conforms to this sort of, you know, we, we, we hate celebrities except until we make our own and, and they wanted to put like a, a Kid Rock on the same tier as a Taylor Swift um, or, or even a Laura Trump on the same tier as a God knows who. Um, but they really are like very thirsty to have a culture of their own, um, even if it's sort of 
bad. Even if it's sort of like not good. Uh, and, the, and these movies they make are just, oh God, they're so, they're so bad. They're so terrible. But it's proof that you can throw money at problems and make things. Um, and Laura Trump, they threw money at auto-tune. And somebody wrote her a song that was not great. Um, but it's it's so weird when you have art bound to ideology like that. Um, it's so weird when you have art bound to, to like the Trump cult like that. Um, and and Laura, don't sing. I, I, it, look, if I put out an album, I want you all to go, Rick, what the fuck were you thinking? Because that's not my voice. I, I can't sing for shit. Um, but what, what the fuck was she thinking is the, is the question. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Um, well, folks, listen, we're going to wrap this episode of the Enemies List up. It's a Q&A episode. We're going to try to do more of these. Again, I, the feedback was tremendous last time. Um, and I've gotten so many more questions that I could possibly answer. And again, I will freely admit I went from the newest back. Um, and and I want to make sure that we answer more of these in the future. Uh, folks, listen, do me a favor. Uh, if you are on your podcast app right now, do me a favor, like, follow, review, star, do all the things that you're supposed to do in this social media world. We are all slaves to the algorithm. Appreciate that very much. Look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of The Enemies List.